Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 340, recorded March 30th, 2018. John Battelle. Welcome to Triangulation. This is the show where we talk to some of the most interesting people in technology today. I am very excited to talk to John Battelle. He is the founder of six companies. He helped launch Wired Magazine, launch the Industry Standard, Federated Media, the Web 2.0 Summit, Nuco, and others. He's also the author of the 2005 book, back when people still read books, The Search, huh. How Google and Its Rivals Rewrote the Rules of Business and Transformed Our Culture. Thanks for joining us, John. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me, Megan. So I want to start just in your background. You have a journalism background, but you've mostly been in the technology space. What came first, your interest in journalism or technology? They were equal, uh, I would say. Um, uh, having though no skills, I mean, I did a bit of coding. Um, I actually put myself halfway through college doing, um, some scripting, which I guess would be called scripting now, but in the 1980s, it was database scripting. Um, I didn't know that that was a thing you could do and, you know, that it would turn into a career. Uh, I just had to learn how to do it <clears throat> so I could make a little extra money. Uh, and we were coding apps, uh, search apps for, uh, uh, college search databases. As a matter of fact, that app in the 1980s, I think is still better than what's online today, but that's another story. Um, but uh, I, what I was way better at uh, was writing um, and being angry about shit. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, if you're good at those two things, you've got to be a journalist. Uh, um, and uh, But I was obsessed with one thing in technology um, at the time, and that was the Macintosh. Um, and, uh, you know, this is pre-internet. Um, so the Macintosh just seemed to me to be the most important thing in the world. So I combined that obsession with, uh, what budding talents I might've had as a journalist, um, and went to work at a startup magazine that covered Apple. Um, and that's, that's how it all started. What was your first Mac? Uh, let's see. My first Mac was a 1984 Mac, like the first Mac, um, which which I um, basically commandeered from a friend of mine in college. Um, he had gotten it from his parents as a Christmas gift. And I'm like, thanks very much. I've got work to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, after after college, actually, I then, you know, he took it back after about six months and um, I, I bought a, you know, a, a rip off IBM, you know, clone PC. Um, but then when I got the job out of college, I, I had, you know, the top end Macs because we were a Mac shop covering the Macintosh. Um, so I think I started with an SE and then I got a CI and, you know, from, went from there. Yeah. I was going to ask you at the magazine, were you guys actually using Macs? Cause back then, I mean, most offices, I guess more, most creative offices, many creative offices were using Macs, but it was a lot of PC back then, mostly. It was mostly PC, and that was the story of our magazine. We were a trade publication for uh, for business people who had gone to the Macintosh. So we were kind of on this mission to prove that the Mac could be used instead of the PC. Um, and so my job was to like call people you know, at very large companies and, and, and after, you know, learning in one way or another that they had, you know, ordered 100 Macs or 500 Macs or 1000 Macs and ask them why they ordered Macintoshes and what, you know, what, what were they doing with them and, you know, write articles about that, which sounds kind of silly now, but it was a big deal. You know, I remember when Arthur Anderson, you know, ordered 10,000 Macs, it was like a huge, huge story for us because um, here was, you know, uh, proof that this computer with its new approach to the world was um, was better for large corporations. Um, and, and that gave me a background in understanding the uh, the vicissitudes and the, um, you know, the processes uh, and the demands uh, and the bureaucracy of very large companies, um, which has served me very well over the years um, as as my career has gone in lots of different directions. 
So that first job was before grad school. That was before grad school, yeah. Um, and and uh, the reason I actually ended up going to the graduate school of uh, journalism at UC Berkeley um, was because I I wrote I was very prolific at Mac Week. And I wish I had a, some magazine covers in my office to show you, but um, but I don't. Um, and no one, none of my friends, and, and and most importantly, my mother had no idea what I did. It, you know, so I'm like, look, I'm on the, I, I did a cover story again. I wrote a cover story about HyperCard, you know, um, and and they're like, well, you know, crickets. Um, you know, why aren't you writing for GQ? Why aren't you writing for the New Yorker? Why aren't you writing for you know uh, publications I care about? Um, and uh, and so I was determined because I thought this story was so big. Um, the story of technology and its impact on culture was so big uh, that I would go back to graduate school uh, and sort of get a piece of paper uh, that, uh, you know, proved that I was capable of writing in those, you know, awesome, uh, glossy New York magazines. Uh, and so that was uh, it was with that sort of intent that I went back to graduate school uh, and left that magazine. And then it was at graduate school where um, I came up with the idea uh, for a magazine that covered technology the way Rolling Stone covered uh, music. Um, and that idea turned into Wired. Um, and, and I wasn't the person who made it happen. I just was the person who had a similar idea and happened to run into the person who made it happen, who brought me on board as a partner and, and off we went. And then from there, you know, lots of chaos ensued. <laughs> so did you actually run into that? I mean, I you know, that's part of the lore that like you were the guy they roped in um, yeah. from Berkeley because you had done a project uh, that that was what yeah. I read about, you know, creating the Rolling Stone for the digital age. Like, yeah. did you actually just run in or did they seek you out or did you seek them out? What, tell us more about well, that. Well, they saw, they, it's a funny story. They, 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 they sought me out, um, but only after they sought out a guy that I worked with at that magazine we just discussed, Mac Week, the Macintosh magazine. They sought him out first. He was older, more senior, um, uh, and they offered him the job that I ultimately took, uh, and he said no. And he said no because he thought, you know, it was like a fly-by-night startup with like no funding and, you know, just two or three crazy people um, in a, you know, rundown warehouse, you know, full of garbage. I mean, it was really not something that if you were a responsible person with kids, you would have taken <laughs> this offer, right? So he said, but I know someone, um, and he's just graduating from Berkeley. Uh, he's a great guy, you know. Um, a lot of energy. Um, and so he gave them my number. Uh, and uh, I was like up in the Sierra Nevada backpacking or something. And I, and I came back uh, through <clears throat> a small town on my way home and uh, checked my voicemail. I mean, you used to have to do that. You know, you stop at a payphone and like check your voicemail. Um, and uh, and there was a message from this guy, Louis Rossetto, from a place called Wired. And I was doing a lot of freelance writing to put myself through graduate school. And I thought he was like a PR guy, you know, um, and Wired was probably some networking company that he wanted to pitch me. And I almost deleted it. Um, <laughs> but I thought, you know, if it was a decent story, I, you know, I, I always need money. I was going to move to New York and try to write for all those publications. So, you know, you never know. So I call him back. And he proceeded to pitch me the idea that I had uh, pitched to the Graduate School of Journalism as my master's thesis. I mean, it was literally the same idea. And I was like, oh, my God, are you really doing this? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, where where are you? Can I meet you? Um, and uh, and so I went in and met with him and Kevin Kelly uh, and the three of us became the editors that started Wired. I mean, as soon as I walked into that office, I was like. I'm so in. <laughs> this is it's so in. This is going to be awesome. It was like forming a band, you know. It was really like it really was. It was like I can play music with these guys, you know. Um, let's go write some music. So was so is there a garage story? Where did you guys start? Did you start? Um, you started yeah, in San Francisco. We started on the on the top floor of a warehouse in what is uh, in South Park in San Francisco, which is a now very famous, uh, you know, sort of startup uh, ghetto. Um, back then, uh, as I understand it, I did not source or find the building. Um, but, um, when I walked into it, you know, I mean, you had to step over the junkies and, you know, literally it was full of garbage. Um, the garbage had kind of been cleared into the back of the warehouse. Um, but it was very, very inexpensive real estate. 
it's now some of the most expensive real estate in San Francisco. But in 1992, it was, you know, south of market by about five or six blocks um, off the beaten path. Um, and but big, a big, airy loft kind of warehouse situation and uh, and lots of room to grow. And we, you know, we stayed in that to South Park space for a couple of years until we outgrew it and went uh, one block over to the other side of South Park, where Wired still is today, at least in San Francisco offices are uh, on Third Street. Mm. So, yeah, I, I remember I, I worked on Third Street in 99. So then I worked in the same building as the Wired.com. Um, yeah, that was down the street. Yeah. When we, I mean, we... <laughs> You know, uh, Lewis, uh, I think, was really a very, um, he, he had a very uh, clear sense of where he thought the future was going. And, and in 1993, uh, after we had had some initial success with the magazine, um, it became very evident how important the Internet was. Um, and so we wanted to do an Internet version of the magazine. Um, and we had an argument between calling it Wired.com or calling it Hotwired. Mm. And making an entirely new brand and reinventing everything just for the internet because it's a new medium and why you can't just take one medium and put it on the next medium, right? That's the mistake that they made with radio plays on television and and, and you know so on. Uh, and uh, so we decided to not only make an entirely new brand, Hot Wired, we would have it in an entirely different building. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so that was the building that you went to because that was, you know, their space and their. And so they basically were, you know, told to go figure it out. And we, as the original founders of the company, would manage them. Um, uh, but they, they basically, you know, ran a pirate ship over there. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't remember what it was called. I remember it wasn't Wired.com. Yeah, it was Hotwired. And they did Code Monkey yeah. and all those oh, so things. Many. So many. And we actually... Um, we would have management meetings, um, and I remember one of them uh, where, um, you know, we we had hired, I think, somewhere about 40 staff at Hotwired, 4-0, which was more than we had on the magazine. Um, and uh, during this meeting, you know, which is only five of us, right, um, the question arose, how are we going to pay them? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we'd hired them. So now what? Right. And, um, reasonable question, I think to ask is, you know, and I was the managing editor of the magazine, uh, and, uh, overall, uh, of the, what we call wired ventures, which owned all the operating companies, including hot wired. It's like, how are we going to pay these people? And, um, we needed a business model for hot wired for the online site. And given that it was one of the first online sites, uh, that was commercial in the world, uh, there was GNN, which is O'Reilly's site, and Yahoo had, I think, uh, just launched, but it was very early. Um, we just invented in that meeting um, what became the uh, banner ad. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I'll never forget, Lewis, you know, I suggested this banner ad, but I suggested putting it at the bottom of the screen because um, I was basically stealing the idea from an online service called Prodigy, which maybe some people listening would remember. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and Lewis said, no, 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 let's, let's not put it at the bottom. Let's put it at the top so that people can scroll it out of the way. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought that was genius, you know, um, uh, it's just like people could flip the page on the magazine and, you know, make it go away, make the ad go away. Right. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the technology uh, question arose, which is how are we going to serve this ad where we use the same, you know, uh, content management system that we had built to serve our, you know, HTML content, our, our, our web editorial content. And the decision was taken that that would be crazy. We have to because, you know, remember, I was a journalist and I had a master's degree in journalism. We had to keep the separate the lines between church and state. So we, we created a different technology infrastructure for the advertising as opposed to the content. And that created um, an ad server. Uh, and uh, the rest is kind of history. The, the, the ad tech business, double click, you know, uh, that entire kind of the bifurcation between content and advertising and the whole ad tech infrastructure that has built up the tens of billions of dollar industry around that started with, you know, 
should we put the ad tech together with the content tech or not? And if you look at the one company that has essentially reintegrated them, right? So that the ad and the content tech is the same, it's Facebook. Oh. Um, and I, and there's a whole 20 year history between that meeting at Wired and today where my career, you know, has to do with trying to integrate those two sides in a, in, in a business model that doesn't destroy everything it touches. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, those are the two endpoints, the, the decision in that meeting and, uh, Facebook today. Wow. Yeah. The birth of the ad <laughs> server to where we are now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, in those beginning days of Wired, um, it, you were asking questions, the, the big questions, like what if the government is, could track everything? And, and what, what if technology could transform education? And these are questions that we're still, why haven't we answered these questions? <laughs> that was 1993. <laughs> um, so, you know, are, yeah. and how are those questions the same and different now? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question in and of itself. Um, the questions are extremely similar. The people interested in the answers are extremely different. Mm. Um, so, you know, back when we were asking those questions for the early issues of Wired, we were writing for a very small group of people who were obsessed with this, with the overarching uh, narrative of the impact of technology on society. I mean, I would say it was more akin to creating a, you know, um, uh, a foundational literature for a religious cult than it was, you know, um, doing, you know, the kind of uh, broad based sort of, you know, societal chin scratching that, that, that we're doing now. Um, there, we, we had an extremely rabid group of very technologically literate readers. Right. And you had to be very literate to even understand what the Internet was and how it worked in 1994. Right. Um, and why it mattered. And, and, and you know, all the questions that uh, that uh, directly connecting with uh, people over long distances created. Right. And we had our our sort of resident philosophers and our bards like John Perry Barlow or Stuart Brand. Um, uh, who, you know, rallied our, you know, core, uh, you know, masses. But but now you have almost everybody in the world who's, you know, functionally literate asking similar questions. Mm -hmm. um, and the complexity of those answers uh, has, you know, risen, you know, magnitudes of order, as have the um, potential um, of, you know, real time proof uh, that the questions matter. So there was an awful lot of speculative, you know, uh, framework for the early uh, wired uh, work. We would say, what will happen when every classroom in the country uh, or in the world has access to the internet and, uh, you know, has connected machines so that you can access any, you know, knowledge and connect classrooms to each other or to experts uh, and to teachers around the world and so on. We would ask what would happen, what would change, you know, how does the educational system need to change to accommodate such a thing? Um, but now all of that's true. And so the question is, what the hell have we done and how do we fix it or how do we do it better? Or, you know, here are here are examples of what they're doing in Estonia versus what they're doing in, you know, uh, in, 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 you know, China. Um, so there's just so much more to report on. There's so much more specific detail. Um, but I think what we've hit uh, in the last year or so is a realization that we need to step back and look at the bigger picture again. And I think that's why Wired still resonates to this day is it's maintained that larger framework of, um, you know, what are we doing? Where are we going? How do we think about this? Um, and And I think it's another reason that, you know, uh, long form conversations like this one, um, podcasts and so on are doing so well is that people really feel like they need to, you know, take a bath and not a short shower and really sort of steep in some of these questions. And because we, we, we're, I like to say, um, 
we're over our skis um, societally. Um, we are using tools and systems that we do not fully understand. Uh, and we are not capable of running all of the math and all of the scenarios of the impact of the systems we're using. But we're using them anyway. Um, and we're sort of crossing our fingers and hoping it all works out. And it turns out that when you do that, there are many bad actors and groups of people who are happy to take advantage of the ignorance that we are, you know, uh, happily displaying. Um, and uh, we've seen lots of that in the last year. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Facebook is such a good example of that. I mean, I was thinking, we talk a lot about, we've talked a lot in the last four or five years about Facebook's black box. They have this algorithm that we don't understand. And, you know, we have this image of them just keeping it, you know, Mark Zuckerberg standing over it, holding it tight. But really, I mean, what we're beginning to understand is he didn't even really understand how it worked, you know, and they, and, and people there, like, I mean, he didn't, they just have lost control of it, it seems. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I've written, I've written exactly that several times over the past four or five months. Um, I wrote a piece called Lost Context, uh, which did a little bit of the history that we've gone over, but not so much the wired stuff, but the ad tech stuff and the ad platform stuff. Um, and uh, as I recall, the subhead was that, you know, we've built systems that are out of control. That used to be a good thing now and not so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and, and I said the same thing, um, you know, I do not believe that anyone at Facebook really understands how Facebook works. Um, and uh, that is, that has become a fundamental problem in our democratic system. And to think that in 1993, we, we were running around waving our hands saying everything's going to change and democracy is going to be, you know, deeply impacted by all this technology. And people either thought we were crazy and ignored us or, you know, drank the Kool-Aid and bought the magazine. Um, it, but here it is really happening. It took 25 years, but it's really happening. Um, this is a fundamental threat to democratic uh, capitalism. Um, and how we respond uh, is sort of the test of our, of our current age. Um, and I think the reason uh, so many people are up in arms right now is because Facebook's initial response was not the appropriate response. Um, and its ongoing response has been uh, tone deaf, flat footed and self-serving. Um, and I say that with great love for many people at that company, but it's too big a company to blame any one person or set of people for how the company is responding. I think um, a company responds the way it is characteristically built to respond. And the crisis crises have gotten bigger than its ability to respond. So I wrote a piece, I think it was on Monday of this week, um, uh, where the headline was literally what I thought they should be saying. Um, yeah, we allowed this to happen. We're sorry. We need your help. Um, this is a much bigger problem. And you can see the two issues of Wired there. There's an uh, iconic company, Apple, in 1996 or 7, uh, we put on the cover when Apple was almost dead. It was on life support. Mm -hmm. And we loved Apple. And so we said, pray, you know, pray for Apple. Um, and there's Wired, you know, I had nothing to do with this brilliant cover uh, that w from, uh, I guess it's the February issue, but it has a March cover date um, with Mark being beat up there. But, you know, iconic companies can fall. Um, and um, when Apple was failing, we, you know, it didn't really matter to the world. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, it wasn't like, you know, some grand thesis was going to be disproven, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but with Facebook, there's a lot more at stake. Um, and we have over 2 billion people who are using the platform. Um, and and we're, you know, I'm not predicting that Facebook's going to fail. But if it, if it does not understand that it cannot solve this problem alone, that in fact, this problem is a society-wide problem that requires 
unfortunately, I guess, some messy human connections that, you know, regulators and industry pundits like us and, uh, you know, uh, technologists, of course, but uh, sociologists and academics and 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 other technology companies uh, and, you know, a group effort to figure out how do we secure the platforms we love? Um, how do we secure them uh, inside the framework of, uh, of idealistic democratic values? Um, it is not the job of one company to do that. This is not something you can buy a full page ad in the New York Times, say you're sorry, blame someone else and move on. You cannot do that anymore. This is too big a deal. Um, and so that's what that piece was about. Um, and, uh, and I think that we have some pretty fundamental questions to ask ourselves about what are the values we want embedded in the services that we use every day. And I think we've been presuming that those values are already embedded there because the values are on the homepage or the about page of Facebook. You know, we want the world to be more open and connected. We want it to be all about communities. Open and connected to me, I think, means something quite different than what it means inside one hacker way. Um, and I think understanding what open connected means, really means, is the true work to be done, not just at Facebook, but by all of us. Um, I'm a, uh, on a you know, unapologetic open web um, uh, advocate. Um, and I do not believe that Facebook is an open web company. Yeah. So I, I, I did really that like that piece that you did comparing Apple and Facebook at the brink of something. Like, I, I don't think that Facebook is the brink of, of, you know, ending. I just think it's something's got to change about it. And right. you, know, you do talk about how it's about leadership. Like, you know, Apple was able to come back to life because of Steve Jobs. Um, and but now, and even today, today's big news is Andrew Bosworth, right? I don't know if you've seen yeah, this. I've seen that piece, yeah. <laughs> so BuzzFeed leaked a memo that he wrote about, you know, he says, so we connect more people that can be bad if they make it negative. Maybe it costs a life by exposing someone to bullies. Maybe someone dies in a terrorist attack coordinated on our tools. And, and he goes on to say these things that, that sound really callous. And he defends himself by saying, this was, this is how we did it at Facebook. We put out big ideas and then we had, you know, people, you know, discuss them. And he got a lot of feedback back and it opened a good discussion. And so there's something to be said about that, but we're talking about a company that's that is has so much impact, like you said. I mean, the world wasn't going to change fundamentally if Apple went under. But I mean, I guess you could make an argument that our lives would be different if Apple did go under. Then it but, would be very it would be very different. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. But we would still have something that looks like this. Yeah, and we would have uh, something that looks no. like that that didn't have. Um, you know, that didn't have all, maybe that didn't keep all the device, you know, all the private info on the device. Like there's all, you know, if you could imagine a world where, without Apple, that that's a different discussion. I guess my question is, um, you know, what, how can you compare those two? Like, is there, is it, is it possible for Facebook to go under at this point? What do you think is going to happen next? Um, I think it's, it's entirely possible for Facebook to go under, but it won't go under uh, as dramatically as it seemed. Apple was about to go under. As you, you may recall, Apple was essentially saved through a landmark deal with its nemesis, uh, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, it was like uh, I can't a multi hundred million dollar deal where Microsoft um, just basically saved Apple. And the reason it saved Apple is it needed a competitor. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and and I don't think you know it's that you know I don't know that anyone would come in and save. Facebook, but I could see Facebook going the way of Yahoo, uh, right, where it sort of has a massive business that just declines for years and years and years. And people like, like two years from now, we're like, yeah, I used to love Facebook, but man, I don't use it very much anymore and kind of don't like the company, but it has its core users who never stop using it. And, you know, but it's just it falls out of favor. And over time, you know, even Instagram or WhatsApp to fail to 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 continue to grow. I, I could imagine a scenario like that. Um, 
But it is a, it's a, it, my issue with Facebook, uh, and this is another piece that I wrote called Facebook Can't Be Fixed, which I wrote in response to Mark's New Year's resolution, um, uh, is that their core business model is, you know, fundamentally um, a creator of ex externalities that are very difficult to um, to change. Uh, they have built a business that uh, gives advertisers and particularly legions of small advertisers. We tend to obsess about the Procter and Gambles and the, you know, uh, GMs and the Unilevers of the world using Facebook. And they do. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars on the platform because it gives them incredibly targeted, uh, you know, messaging space. But the real power of Facebook is the same power that Google has uh, in Google search and at YouTube, which is the millions of advertisers who spend $50 or $100 or $200 a month. Um, and they are the long tail of power who are and they're doing God knows what on the platform. Right. Um, well, now we found out they're spending $100,000 to create viral content, which impacts 120 million people. Right. That's what the Russians did. Um, so the power of that platform is so dramatic. And the system, the self-service system they built to target that content so, uh, you know, uh, accurately and with such impact is such an amazing business that if they were to throttle that business, we're not talking about a 10 or a 15 or a 20% revenue hit. We're talking about a 50% revenue hit. Um, and <clears throat> I don't think they'll ever do that because they'll get sued out of existence by their shareholders. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? So they're in this sort of capitalistic catch 22. Um, and that's, that's a creation of our society. Facebook is what it is because we set the rules such that Facebook would be created. You know, it is a natural outgrowth of the world we built. So we need to rethink some of the fundamental rules of this world we've built and then give Facebook and other companies like it time to adjust to that new reality. And I think we're seeing some blunt examples of that in Europe with uh, GDPR, uh, the general generalized data protection uh, regulations. Um, now, the, the problem is that they're very blunt uh, and they focus on this idea of first party data um, and Facebook has almost entirely first party relationships, right? We all are logged in and we all use it. So it actually may end up that the first new regulatory regime uh, that is of significant consequence on a society wide basis in democratic capitalism makes the walled gardens have higher walls, mm. <laughs> um, which I don't think is the intent. Um, but it's interesting nonetheless, and it is a step. And the question is, what are the next steps? Um, and, and that's the reason that at the work I'm doing now uh, with Nuco, Nuco Shift, um, is to have a conversation about the intersection of technology, uh, business, and politics. Um, and uh, if you go to shift.nuco.co, you'll see a bit more, or forum.nuco.co. Um, we spend uh, an inordinate amount of time uh, talking about what is the role of business in society? How do we rethink the relationship and expectation set of business as it relates to society? Um, and I think that's a conversation that's probably the most important conversation we can have right now. Um, just as back 25 years ago, uh, we thought that the most important conversation that we could have was what is going to happen when technology impacts society? Right mm -hmm. um, now, I think the question is, OK, we can see it everywhere around us. What are we going to do about it? Um, 
And and the beauty of this, and also it's a hot mess, but the beauty of it is, is that everyone wants to now have that conversation. So how do you do it at scale? And I think if you look at Facebook's response, they're like, well, what do you mean? How do you do it? We just built a platform that is perfect for this conversation. Just do it on Facebook. Do everything on Facebook. As a matter of fact, the whole problem can be solved if everyone just uses only Facebook. Just keep using Facebook. The answer to fixing Facebook is use it more. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> the, the answer is not to do that. The answer is to ask more interesting questions um, and to bring more people into the conversation uh, and to remember that there's a very big world out there and a lot of externalities um, and that we need to rethink the regulatory framework in which our built systems operate. That doesn't mean we need to regulate them to death. It just means that it's clear our current regulatory framework is not working. Yeah, I mean, regulation is just a, such a packed term. And what's it's, interesting uh, right yeah. now is that a lot of the changes that Facebook is making is because they're being forced to by the regulations, but they're not necessarily talking about that. And neither are average people. Like they're making it the story of like, we heard Cambridge Analytica. We, you know, we heard that this is upsetting. We want to change it. We're going to do this and this and this, but it's not really because of that. It's because of the regulation, but it seems to me like either we don't want to listen to that part of it or they're trying kind of hiding it and making it more about feelings. So it's just yeah. weird that the two have come at the exact same time. Well, I think, you know, so far their response has been, we are so sorry that there was a bad actor who did bad things using features that we've now gotten rid of. Mm -hmm. So the problem's taken care of. We found the bad actor and we shut off those features. So problem solved. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, while it's true that now people cannot hoover up data from Facebook and use it in the way that Cambridge Analytica used it anymore, what is still true is anybody can go on that self-service app and buy any audience they want and target them with any message they want to. Um, and the work of figuring out which message is okay to target to people and which, which people and which message is not okay is work that is beyond the scope of a market-driven company. That is a conversation that a society should have, not a company. Um, and I think that it's that slowly dawning realization that we have built an almost perfect influence machine uh, that is, is, is at the core of what we need to understand. Facebook has acquired the public square. And as a society, we are realizing that our public commons is no longer truly public. Uh, and we are trying to understand what does that mean? How do we once again make the commons public? And what does that mean? What does public mean? Um, and this is at a moment when, at least in the United States and like in, in the UK as well, we are have we're in a populist moment of revolt over the concept of failed government. So we are very suspicious of public because we don't think it works. Um, and this is a dangerous moment. Um, and this is one of the at the forum, uh, the Nuco Shift Forum. Uh, we had one of the major uh, themes that we discussed was the future of democracy. And we had former world leaders from places like Latvia, uh, the president of Latvia after the uh, fall of the Soviet Union, uh, uh, Bolivia uh, and the Gen uh, secretary general of the Organization of American States, who's currently dealing with Venezuela right now, um, and uh, former prime ministers of Canada, um, you know, debating what 
is democracy and how does technology impact democracy? The idea that that conversation would have happened even two or three years ago is kind of laughable, but now it's very serious because democracy, it turns out, is on the retreat. We in the United States seem, oh, it's, you know, everything's always going up and to the right. No, democracy is going down uh, uh, and to the right. And, you know, we've lost Turkey, we've lost Hungary, we're losing Poland. Um, and uh, the former prime president of Latvia is pretty sure Latvia is next. We lost Crimea. Um, you know, we lost Russia. Uh, uh, I hate to be kind of a, you know, negative, you know, Cassandra here, but um, we're, we're starting to lose America, uh, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to democracy. And Cambridge Analytica is sort of a strong proof point. Um, uh, as is the fact that, you know, um, uh, we have a, a, a humongous surge in, 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 uh, in, in white nationalism, which has been driven in no small part by uh, former KGB agents uh, in St. Petersburg who pretend to be uh, white nationalist YouTubers. Um, uh, and they they create this content that is driven by the honeypot algorithms of YouTube to draw in disaffected, isolated, disconnected, unhappy young people uh, into a philosophy that uh, essentially is re religious conversion to uh, anti-democratic values. I, I, if I were saying shit like this two or three years ago, you'd probably not even put me on this show. <laughs> But there is so much proof of this now, and it is so real that you cannot say it. it's just a conspiracy theory. It's happening. Mm -hmm. and, and so this, I hope I'm making the point, is a bigger story than how does Facebook respond to a crisis of a company that misused data. This, this is a bigger story than how does YouTube implement AI and machine learning to get rid of weird YouTube videos that are inappropriate for children. Um, this is a story of massively powerful platforms that we do not understand well enough and that we need to get our arms around and we should not expect. I'm not saying we should not trust. I'm saying we should not expect the people who run these companies to be responsible for fixing this because this is the intersection of two of the most powerful forces in the last two centuries, technology and democracy. And these two forces have collided uh, in a way that has created a spectacular, you know, car wreck. <laughs> And we need to understand what's just happened and what is happening. And we need to respond in a thoughtful and, you know, non-crisis mode way. You know, you can't just slap AI and say everything's cool. I mean, I cannot believe that, you know, anyone, any journalist who asks Facebook, hey, are you prepared for the midterm elections? I'm not kidding. Their response is, we totally got it. And I mean, no one wants to admit that uh, that something they saw on Facebook might have influenced the way they voted. I mean, there's not a single person that would ever want to admit that. I mean, I'm just coming to terms with, you know, I always knew who I was going to vote for and it was never going to change. But perhaps things that I saw on Facebook made me think differently about her. And I was I still voted for her. But like I, I am willing to accept now that there were probably things that I scrolled through that weren't true. But I didn't spend the time thinking about it. That was like, well, I'll vote for her because she's my candidate. But I sure wish there was someone better. But but you know what I'm saying? Like nobody's going to admit that. And so if yeah. the yeah, I mean, you bring up such a good point. So, so you know, think about how do you counter the 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 the, the idea that um, that you know weaponized misinformation has has been turned upon you personally and the public at large. How do you create a citizenry? capable of managing that new fact. Well, you can't just run a, you know, a counter ad campaign. You actually have to start thinking systemically about what is the curriculum you teach in school? 
how do you create a, you know, a, a sense of digital literacy and truth seeking? How do you integrate uh, trust uh, and, 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 you know, validity into a system where almost anything can be created that looks real, right? Um, at the forum, we had the C, uh, CTO of Adobe uh, uh, on, and he acknowledged that uh, essentially with their tools, you can create video and audio that would possibly take what I'm saying right now and make it sound like I was advocating for a neo-Nazi party, right? Um, so, you know, we are in a moment where we're realizing that we have to fundamentally rethink trust in our society. And how do you authenticate and validate trust? Now, who are some of the best organizations to help us do that? Without question, it's the technology companies, right? But not without uh, trusted third parties validating how they're going about it. Uh, and that those trusted third parties are uh, under the regulatory scrutiny of a democratic system, right? So that's the that's the grand renegotiation of the contract between business and society that's happening right now. It's, to me, the biggest story in the world. Um, and one that hundreds of millions of people are starting to realize is really important. And of course, we're going to get a lot of different answers and a lot of different, you know, approaches and solutions to how this gets done uh, at the micro level in municipalities and cities like how do we manage, you know, the armies of Ubers and Lyfts that are clogging the streets of our cities to the, you know, massively macro, which is like, what's the World Bank's policy towards lending, right? So there's, there's, it, it is a, a mind boggling amount of rethinking that we're in the midst of doing as a, you know, global society. Um, and it's very exciting and challenging and overwhelming. Um, but we're at the moment of the of the core test, you know, the, the, the test that, uh, that, you know, when you start to really think about it, uh, it's the, you know, it's the, it's the final exam for humanity. <laughs> you know, are we going to get past, um, the, the tools that we figured out how to make? Are we going to, are we going to be able to understand how to, uh, control and manage the power that we have discovered? The first test is nuclear. Um, so far, we've passed it for the most part. But the next test is synthetic biology and uh, artificial intelligence and generalized artificial intelligence. Um, uh, and and these are very, very difficult and complicated tests. Um, and, uh, you know, the game's afoot. And it's important we talk about this. So if it's, I mean, you called it a business model bind that these companies are in. Um, so, and, and we can't expect them to, to regulate themselves. So, so do you think the answer is regulation? Um, I think the answer is yes, some kind of new regulation. People forget that no matter what, we're in a regulatory environment. This is a, this is a, a, a point made by Robert Reich, among others, uh, economists make the point that even a uh, unregulated free market economy is thereby regulated. The regulation is there's no regulation. Um, and and therefore, all parties are free to regulate themselves however they want, which they will do by their practices. So there is plenty of regulation. It's just not that it's a uh, necessarily a uh, government mandated uh, regulation. Um, but we already have yeah, untold thousands of pages of regulation that all these companies have to abide by. Um, I'm not arguing for more and more on top of it. I'm arguing that we rethink the regulatory framework we're, we're in. So it's not more and more, it's different and better. Um, and, you know, there's lots of schools of thought about what those should be. Um, and I'm not an expert in any of them. Um, but I would say that it's important that for an informed citizenry that we as journalists start to lay out what those possible scenarios might look like, name them, explore them so that we can start to vote uh, with our, you know, uh, 
our elected representatives, uh, uh, propositions and ballots and so on. There's a very important ballot gaining steam in California that's essentially like the European GDPR, GDPR but for um, California, for the state of California, uh, as a ballot proposition. Um, so there's a lot of this stuff flying around. And the question is, what's appropriate? Uh, what's smart to test and learn? Um, Self-regulation, I still think, is very important, uh, and I think the things that Facebook and Google and others are doing is is, is an important part of the solution, but not the whole solution. Um, and you know, a lot of people are calling for antitrust um, for breaking up these companies, and I think there may be something to be said for part part of that. Um, I would, for example, if we can pivot to Amazon, which I think is getting less scrutiny than perhaps it should. Um, Although President Trump seems to have ratcheted that up yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, Amazon, for example, has an incredible piece of, uh, of national security apparatus called AWS. Uh, and AWS is, is now, I would say, as important to the national security of the United States and other countries uh, as our electric grid or the water system. Um, it's essentially how some of our biggest and most important companies uh, do business. And if someone were to take AWS down tomorrow, um, it, havoc would ensue in our economy. I mean, we're talking about major banks that run their entire banking infrastructure on AWS. We're not just talking about like all the cool startups, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, would it make more sense for that to be an independent company that sees as its core purpose um, the in insurance that that utility never go down and never fall prey to uh, bad actors um, and was not strategically uh, required to feed uh, all of Amazon's other businesses? Might make sense. Yeah. Right. I mean, it might make sense. Um, and 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 would its strategic imperatives, its uh, long term business planning be different if it were independent than if it were part of a company that also uh, was responsible for making sure a drone drops off a package in front of your house within half an hour or supplied you with all of your entertainment or had one of the largest uh, networks of uh, consumer data driven advertising in the world, which, by the way, Amazon does have. People just don't notice, um, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, dominated the, you know, entire uh, retail sector. Would it be important that that company was not influenced by those other uh, business imperatives? One could argue pretty strongly that it might make sense for that piece of national security driven infrastructure known as AWS to not be affected by those other things. Um, we are placing an inordinate amount of trust in Jeff Bezos right now. Um, and uh, that trust to the most, for the most part has been earned. Um, but as we saw uh, over the last couple of months with Facebook, uh, um, perhaps we should be thinking a little differently about that. And antitrust is again, our sort of sledgehammer approach to fixing it. But uh, it strikes me that there may be other uh, more uh, appropriate responses. Uh, for example, it might make perfect business sense to spin AWS out. Uh, maybe Amazon keeps 20 or 30 or 40 percent of it. Uh, it becomes its own independent public company and Amazon's a major shareholder and they get to participate in the upside of that. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and that's a, a market solution that is not driven by a regulatory sledgehammer. Um, and this, this, I should give credit to this idea uh, to uh, Scott Galloway at NYU. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there, these questions need to be asked, is, is, and they need to be answered. Yeah, I mean, it makes, when you think about that, uh, it makes separating Internet Explorer from, you know, Microsoft, the Microsoft operating system, kind of the Windows operating system, that seems kind of uh, small in comparison <laughs> to AWS yeah. and Amazon. It, you know, <laughs> but here's the thing, what you just referenced, it proves we've been practicing for this moment, Yeah, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and I'm glad we have been, because we're going to need to be 
pretty darn good uh, to figure out, you know, when waves of generalized AI are running over AWS and Google uh, and Apple, and by the way, uh, these are all going to be proprietary black boxes that we do not understand from the outside, from the government. Um, when they start fighting with each other, we're not even going to we're not even going to be able to understand how they're fighting or what they're doing. Um, and and here's another kind of you know mind bender. Right now, at this very moment, and over the past at least five years and probably longer, we have been under f full on assault warfare uh, by a major foreign uh, country, Russia. Um, they have assaulted democracy using the tools we've created. Um, and they continue to assault democracy, uh, even as we speak. And no one's pissed off about it. Now, that's not fair. There are a lot of people angry about it. But the person that matters the most is ignoring it. And that's our president. Um, and that is unconscionable. Uh, and there is a company, and I should give them credit, that is leading in this uh in this uh, issue, and that's Microsoft. They're calling for a digital Geneva Convention that we should get all countries together and create a regulatory framework that basically outlaws cyber warfare, just like we have one that outlaws, you know, traditional warfare, except under certain terms, right? That's the Geneva Convention. Um, and if we are going to have warfare, we're going to do it under some you know, generally accepted rules of humanity. Mm. Right now we have uh, Russia waging war on the United States with no rules. And we have the president of the United States saying, don't worry, it's cool. What the f***? Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I'm glad that one of the most important companies in technology is leading on this effort. And I would like to see Facebook lead on its side of it. And instead of leading my senses that they're defending and uh, they're uh, they're they're defraying and they're, you know, they're, they're pushing blame. Instead, they should say, this is a really big deal and we need help. Mm. And then, God, the world would rally around them. <laughs> I think the world would. I do. Part of the world would. Yes. Well, well, more than is now, let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's it's I mean, only a year and a half ago was Facebook was being accused of being too too liberal and not letting the other side, you know, and I mean, that was sort of the, the uh, germination of all this. Google as well, right? Yeah. I mean, this is yeah, and and this is very hard. These are these, these, I mean, I would not want to be in the war room at Go at Google or Facebook right now trying to deal with these problems alone. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that they aren't, of course, talking to everyone. I'm sure they are. But it is not an effort that people, that, that citizenry can rally around and say, we've got great people working on this problem together. And everyone's saying, I'm enjoying working on this. It's hard work. But damn it, we're going to get this right. Um, it needs to be a society-wide effort because this is a society-wide problem. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure to talk to you and uh, nice to get to interview you because you're usually the one doing these long conversations. <laughs> I, I am. People. It's, a, um, yeah. it's a pleasure to actually string some thoughts together without <laughs> having to sit in front of a keyboard and figure out how to say them in prose. So thank you for having me. And we're going to get, yeah, we didn't even get to that. You're you're going to be writing something up about uh, Facebook's announcement to to disengage with third parties um, like yeah. Axiom, who you are on the board. I think that's another walled garden problem. I yes. think that's a that's only going to make the walls higher as opposed to where we need to go, um, which is we need to figure out how to communicate and connect and empower uh, everybody. Um, we're, we are at a very, very important moment. And I think what needs to change is that the citizenry needs to take responsibility for their own data. Uh, and, and that is a massive change. But when it happens, I think we will succeed as a society. We cannot assume that uh, you know, anonymous black box platforms uh, should manage our data for us. 
Well, so uh, newco, go to newco.co and you can, can you see all of the interviews that you did at Shift Forum? Uh, yeah, we're rolling them out. It's actually shift.newco.co. Okay. So the, the publication that has all of it is shift.newco.co. There you go. There's our conversation with uh, the former head of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, now the uh, president of the UC system and uh, Reed Hoffman. Uh, there's a conversation with the CEO of Starbucks, uh, Kevin Johnson. Uh, there's the CTO of Adobe. Um, uh, there's Jennifer Palka, who uh, runs Code for America and was the deputy CTO of the U.S. government. Um, there's my piece about democratic capitalism. So you can see a lot of the stuff that we're covering, and and uh, I, you know, I'd love folks to come and 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 engage with what we're doing and and follow us on Medium and you know uh, uh, get involved. Thank you so much, John Mattel. Uh, we didn't even we we skipped over wide swaths of your career, but um, Good. that's all right. <laughs> this is what matters now. Okay, John Mattel, uh, newco.co. Thank you so much for coming on, John. All right. Well, thank you for having me. All right. Take care. Bye. -bye. And thank you for joining us on Triangulation. Triangulation records every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific. You can download and subscribe at twit.tv slash try, or you can watch it live and join us and ask questions too. Um, Triangulation will be back next Friday. It's hosted by me, Megan Maroney, Leo Laporte, uh, Father Robert Balasar, and Jason Howell. Thanks so much for joining us.